Welcome back to Mind Science, episode 34. In today's video, we're going to be covering a highly requested topic that I'm finally getting around to making a video on, and that is the topic of the spiritual ego. Many people ask me to talk more about this so they can get some more clarity around it. And so in today's video, we're going to look at what the spiritual ego is, the different ways that it manifests, and how it is to be transcended. Now, I will begin with the caveat that there really isn't such a thing as the spiritual ego, in the sense that there aren't different types of ego. As I've said in some previous Mind Science episodes, the ego is nothing more than the mental activity of identifying. And so the spiritual ego doesn't function or operate any differently than any other kind of ego. But with that being said, I still believe it's an important topic to discuss because of the fact that what the ego gets identified with will dramatically change the nature of its power and influence and craftiness. And as you'll soon find out, this is where the spiritual ego shines far above all the rest. The spiritual ego is by far the hardest one to recognize within oneself. And so for that reason, it's also typically the last hiding spot that the ego has before being finally transcended. The ego will identify with anything that's placed in front of it. And this is exactly why it's so sneaky. Because by its very nature, the ego is a shapeshifter. And so the less aware we are of it, the less sneaky that it needs to be. But the more our awareness of the ego expands, the more nuanced and complex its disguises must be in order for it to continue going undetected by awareness. And there's no safer disguise for the ego to wear than that of the spiritual seeker. The spiritual ego is that which makes us get addicted to collecting spiritual knowledge. Watch more videos, read more books, learn more spiritual truths. And when we do this, we feel a sense of self being enhanced. And then we mistake that self-enhancement for spiritual progression. And eventually, we acquire far more spiritual knowledge than can be integrated and work ourselves into a dark night of the soul. So intellectual understanding is not the same thing as awareness. The mind creates the spiritual ego the moment that spiritual seeking begins, because seeking implies a seeker. And so from that moment forward, every new concept that the seeker understands will enhance the spiritual ego, because it gives you the notion that there is an I who's doing the understanding. <laughs> and of course, there's just understanding itself, but nobody who does it. We have no clue how understanding happens, or why it happens, or when it's going to happen. What is it that allows me to easily understand something that another person might take years to understand? I don't know. It just happens. And so all understanding is simply an act of grace. But when the mind claims it as my understanding, it turns it into pride. And it's also important to know what we mean in spiritual teachings when we use the word mind, because we're not referring to the brain. What we're referring to is that which arises as I within the mind, or as Ramana Maharshi called it, the I thought. And so this is the reason why the sage has no mind. It doesn't mean that they have no brains. <laughs> It means that they don't have a sense of being a separate subject apart from experience. It means that their sense of I refers to pure consciousness. It doesn't refer to an object or a body or a character and a story on a journey to attain enlightenment. The egoic I always refers to some kind of object, a person, a name, a body a story, a memory, and so forth. 
And this is how the ego keeps its imaginary sense of self alive within the mind. Everything the ego does is for the purpose of enhancing its false sense of being a separate self. Because in reality, there is no separate self. So the ego needs to keep this train constantly moving. Otherwise, it risks you seeing through its disguise. So think about it this way. I was born with no name and no personal history, no sense of being a separate self whatsoever. I was, at that point, the pure, stainless I, pure consciousness. And then at some point, my parents gave me a series of alphabet letters to refer to myself by, and I began identifying myself with that series of letters. I am Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. And then Aaron has experiences which create a personal history, and the ego constantly references that personal history as the evidence for the fact that Aaron really firmly exists. But let's suppose that I get into a car accident and wake up the next day in the hospital with complete amnesia of my past, no memory of even what my first name is. Where's Aaron? At that point, Aaron is nothing but a figment of imagination, an idea that has disappeared from the mind. But what remains? Pure consciousness. So the point here is that no identity in the mind has any reality other than the reality the mind gives to it. And this is the foundation for true jnana, or knowledge. A jnani is the Sanskrit word for one who knows. It is the term used to describe a sage or a realized being, one who lives with the experience of being pure consciousness. And the easiest way to capture what a jnani's state of consciousness is like is to imagine being a part of a cast playing a famous musical on Broadway. And once the performance is over, the whole cast goes out to dinner to eat and celebrate together. And yet, when you get to the table, you notice that everyone is still playing the roles that they were playing on the stage, and fighting and arguing over problems in the play that don't exist in reality. And the nyani is the only one sitting at the table who knows that they aren't the character they were just playing. So, although everyone around the nyani is completely engrossed in their role playing, he is undisturbed by it because he knows that the entire play and its characters are only imagined, and so no problems exist for him, and he remains perfectly at peace. Now, he may still talk to the other cast members about their imaginary problems, but it's only for the purpose of causing them to question it and to wake them up from their false imaginings. Everything the jnani does is for the benefit of others, whereas everything the spiritual ego does is for the benefit of itself, even if it pretends like it's being virtuous. And this is why one of the most famous jnanis of all time, Jesus, told his disciples, When you give to the poor, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He was warning them not to let the spiritual ego hijack their practice, because that is always what the spiritual ego is looking to do. It is incredibly sneaky and clever, and so it has no problem pretending to be a virtuous saint in order to secretly claim credit for one more virtuous act. So let's take a closer look at where this I thought of the spiritual ego arises from and how it establishes its false sense of self within the mind. All that there is, is consciousness, the one universal self. Everything happens by the power of the self alone, and there is no individual that does any of it. The actions of the body, the movements of the mind, and even the ability to understand concepts, all just happens. 
but the mind has evolved for billions of years to create a sense of a separate, independent doer that stands apart from life and acts upon it. And this happens through the I thought. In deep sleep, the I thought returns to its source in the heart center and abides there. But upon waking, the I thought rises to the mind within seconds and starts thinking basic thoughts such as, I have been asleep and now I have woken up. But the I that claims did not perform the sleeping or the waking. It simply happened and the mind took credit for it. And by becoming aware of this activity of identifying, the mind begins to lose its firepower and the I thought slowly begins to run out of hiding spots. Self-realization finally occurs only once the I thought begins to panic from its inability to hide from awareness and eventually retreats to the heart center and then the self begins to pull the I thought into the heart permanently and destroys it so that it never rises again. All sense of being a separate or independent self is gone forever and one experiences themselves as the entire universe. Until this happens, the spiritual ego will always be working to delay self-realization. So this is one of the most obvious manifestations of the spiritual ego, that it always wants to play show and tell with its spiritual knowledge. The spiritual ego wants everyone to know that it's going through a spiritual awakening, or that it already has spiritually awakened. The ego wants to make itself feel special by feeling so alone on the journey that no one understands how lonely it feels to be so spiritually enlightened. Oneness experiences kill the ego, and so it wants to urge you to talk about them as much as possible and turn them into stories, knowing that this will diminish their power. So the one who's in a rush to talk about all their oneness experiences typically loses all their effects. But the one who keeps quiet inside reaps all of their rewards. So I'm sure by this point that many of you are thinking, okay, I can definitely see many of these elements of the spiritual ego within myself. So what can be done about it? How do I go beyond it? And these are questions that I've spent many hours of my life contemplating because, as we've said, the spiritual ego is incredibly slippery and difficult to pin down. Many people spend years of their life believing that they've transcended their ego and talking like an enlightened person, only to one day discover just how enormous their spiritual ego still is. So, in my experience of walking this path, I've discovered what I believe is the deadliest weapon to use against the spiritual ego. And that weapon is the simple question, who cares? <laughs> if you get into the habit of asking this question every time an urge arises in you to prove yourself, then you will continually catch the spiritual ego at work. Dude, you're not going to believe this download I just got in meditation. Let me tell you all about... Wait a minute. Who cares about this download I just got? Am I sharing this download with this person right now for the sole reason that I just want to help liberate them from suffering? Or maybe is part of me sharing this download to prove that I got a download? Maybe the download isn't done downloading. Maybe I should keep quiet for a while and sit with this and listen and see what else wants to be revealed to me through this experience. See, the spiritual ego always disguises itself as an enlightened person, like a wolf in sheep's clothing. But even though it's wearing sheep's clothing and going, bah, bah, it still will salivate at the smell of fresh meat. By asking the question, who cares? You cause the wolf behind the sheep's clothing to begin drooling and salivating because even though it pretends to be one of the sheep who doesn't care, the spiritual ego cares tremendously. What other people think about it is of paramount importance 
to the ego. And so it needs to constantly prove itself and defend itself and impress people. And so by taking a moment to pause and ask yourself the question, who cares so damn much about this right now? It's like holding a fresh, juicy steak underneath the wolf's nose. It will not be able to resist the urge to take a bite of it and announce itself as the I who cares. Let's suppose you write a post on social media about some new concept you just learned, and somebody responds and says, no, 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 this is all wrong. I completely disagree. And you immediately feel triggered and begin writing out your response and boy, you're just going to slice them apart with your superior spiritual knowledge. And then the awareness dawns. Who cares? Am I writing this response just to benefit this person? Or am I maybe writing it to benefit my sense of self? The one who cares about being disagreed with or being seen as wise or spiritual is the ego. So the question, who cares, will always be met with a resounding, I care, by the spiritual ego. Because it must live up to its identities. It will never miss an opportunity to do so, because its very life depends on it. And so this is your opportunity to catch it in action. When you achieve deep states of bliss and stillness in meditation, the spiritual ego is that subtle voice that says, Wow, I can achieve such deep states of bliss and stillness in meditation. Surely I will become enlightened in this lifetime. <laughs> and just like that, it's put you back as a person on a journey to achieve something in the future. The ego wants to turn every spiritual practice into a form of self-improvement. And so the remedy for this is to meditate on the meditator by asking the question, who cares about being improved? Who believes that it needs to be improved? It will be instantly recognized to be the ego masquerading as the meditator. It is impossible to describe the peace and the bliss of the true self. So we only meditate in order to practice being in that state and becoming established in it, but never to improve ourselves or to attain something. The true self is always here and now, and you are always that. So in a very real sense, the true self cannot be realized. The only thing that can be realized is the not-self. And so by continually asking the question, who cares, the not-self is continually revealed. The true self cares about nothing and wants nothing. It is pure, self-shining love and wisdom. And so the more we experience it and fall in love with it, the less interested we are in telling everyone about it, and the more interested we are in embodying it. But before we can embody the true self, our mistaken identities must be given up, especially the spiritual ones. This question, who cares, will eventually give itself up once there is no spiritual ego left to care anymore. Because even to say, well, I don't care, still implies an I who can care. And at some point, this question itself will make no more sense for you. Care about what? For who? For what reason? See, the stage just prior to enlightenment is the stage where one no longer cares whether enlightenment happens or not. It is enough for me to know I am the self. I am not the mind, or the thinker, or the doer, or the one who cares. And when there is no one left to care, enlightenment has dawned. Because the one who cares so much about liberation is the ultimate barrier to liberation. So until this question gives itself up naturally, 
Just keep on asking, who cares? And let the silence of the self be the answer.